Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Speech Graphs as a Tool for Psychiatric Diagnosis, a Physicist's Walk into Computational Psychiatry, presented by Mauro Copelli, Associate Professor of Physics at Federal University at Pernambuco. I am Alexis Carlos of Labyrinths, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labyrinths. Labyrinths is a leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Dr. Copelli will be responding to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2018. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Covelli. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Well, okay, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to present my talk in this very nice conference. I'm going to be talking about speech graphs as a tool for psychiatric diagnosis and Although I'm a physicist talking about psychiatry, the work I'm doing, going to describe has been done in close collaboration with Dr. Natalia Mota, a psychiatrist with a PhD in neuroscience, and Professor Siddhartha Ribeiro, a neuroscientist himself, both at the Brain Institute of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil. Um, naturally, several uh, people were also involved along the way, so I'd like to start by thanking them as well as the funding agencies who, which have made this uh, research possible. So this is the outline of my presentation. Let us start by addressing schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and the subjectivity of psychiatric diagnosis. Schizophrenia is a chronic debilitating mental disease of unknown biological cause with, a, with an estimated prevalence of 0.6%. It has some positive psychotic symptoms like delusions and hallucinations, and negative symptoms like lack of goal-oriented behavior, emotional empathy, etc. Uh, bipolar disorder, on the other hand, is also known as manic depressive disorder, has a slightly larger prevalence, 3% worldwide, and is characterized by episodes of an elevated or agitated mood known as mania, usually alternating with episodes of depression. The cause is also not clearly understood. So the core of the problem is that psychiatric diagnosis is difficult, very difficult. Most diseases lack unequivocal biomarkers. Diagnosis relies on subjective psychometric scales. And the gold standard is a subjective assessment by a trained psychiatrist following the SCID, SCID which is the Structured Clinical Interview for DSM Mental Disorders. DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, whose latest edition came out in 2013. So examples of symptoms assessed, for instance, um, is disorganized speech, affective flattening, and as someone without the training in psychiatry, I can only imagine how difficult it must be to subjectively attribute a number, say, from 0 to 10, to how disorganized a patient's speech is or how flattened their affection. One thing is to diagnose that a patient has some psychiatric disorder, in itself a difficult task. Now, it's even harder for a psychiatrist to tell in which disorder the patient's condition can be classified. For instance, uh, the difficulty of, of establishing um, a, a boundary between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder um, is highlighted by the fact that both share positive psychotic symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, hyperactivity, aggressive behavior, and this difficulty didn't go unnoticed when the fifth edition of the DSM um, was published. It came under heavy criticism. Um, take, for instance, this um, editorial by in, in Nature. 
currently the, the clinical syndromes are generally understood as separate categories. The patient conditions classified as belonging either to the autism spectrum or to schizophrenia, for instance. Yet, those two conditions share a number of symptoms, as you can see here, whose fine-grained subjective analysis is ultimately the main tool for classification. Um, to make matters worse, you see that listed as causes here, you see genes and environment, which is not very informative. And the criticism goes on and on. So research suggests that mental illnesses lie along the spectrum, but the field's latest diagnostic manuals still list them apart. The stark fact is that no one has yet agreed on how to best define and diagnose mental illnesses, and the problem is that biologists have been unable to find any genetic or neuroscientific evidence to support the breakdown of complex mental disorders into separate categories. So I'll be talking a lot about um, diagnosis and equating diagnosis with classification. But this slide should um, keep us keep uh, alerted, keep us alerted to the fact that maybe this is not true. I'm just, we, 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 we're going to classify patients according to those discrete categories here above, all schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, et cetera, but it's not clear, uh, there's not a clear foundation for this clear separation of the, those categories. What we're going to be using essentially is the fact that psychosis affects speech. And then we're going to try to quantify speech structure by somehow reducing its immense dimensionality. By immense dimensionality, I mean that the number of possible speeches is very large, and we want to reduce this very complex space to, uh, uh, to just a few numbers and see if we can, if we can meaningfully work with them. How do we do this? By using speech graphs. So let's move on to our next topic, and, topic and, and discuss a little bit what is a graph, and in particular, what is a speech graph? Well, what is a graph? A graph is another word for a network. Its, origin, its origins go back to the seven breaches of Königsberg, uh, the famous problem, famous problem in which people living in that town we're concerned about this very uh, silly question. Can you walk through the city and cross each bridge once and only once? You have those green bridges and these land masses. So a famous Swiss mathematician, Leonard Euler, in the 18th century, formalized this problem by associating each land mass with a note and each bridge with an, with an edge, and therefore uh, formalizing the situation as a graph like this, and by working with this lower description, from description, he was able to prove that the answer is no to the question. So formally, uh, a graph is just an ordered pair comprising n nodes together with some set of e of edges, and here you have a very simple example, a, b, c, three nodes and one edge, and this is an undirected edge. Compare that with another uh, graph, in which we have, again, A, B, C, three nodes, and two directed edges. So directed edges have their directions, obviously, and directed edges don't. And graphs have been used for a long time in physics. Um, you can have, for instance, this ring of one-dimensional um, aligned atoms, for instance, or two-dimensional structures like this, this lower figure here uh, is graphene, a very thin uh, sheet of um, hexagonal, an hexagonal lattice of carbon, uh, carbon atoms, in which each node is an atom, and the, the, the edges represent chemical bonds. More common, you have this three-dimensional uh, graph, which represents sodium chloride, which is the salt is defined in our kitchen. Now, these regular graphs uh, that we usually traditionally see in physics, I mean, accounting for all the um, condensed matter physics of the 20th century, for instance, they're characterized by um, well-defined neighborhoods. So if this guy is close to these guys and this guy is also close to these guys, so these guys are close to these guys. Essentially, you have a notion of neighborhood which is characterized by some definition of, of uh, clustering coefficient which is high. Also, the distances are large in the sense that if I want to go from one, one 
one site in one part of the network to a very different site in the other part of the network, I have no other way other than just jumping by bond by bond, edge by edge, and therefore taking a long, a large number of steps to reach the other end of the of the network. Now let's contrast the, these regular graphs that are traditionally studied in physics uh, with the, the graphs that were studied in, in mathematics. They are very different. So they were most famously studied by Paul Erdos and Alfred Reni, two mathematicians, who were interested in a different, completely different kind of graph, which is random graphs, in which here you take just a bunch of nodes and randomly connect them with edges. And these kinds of graphs are very different because they have ill-defined neighborhood in the sense that if you have three, for instance, three sites, A is a neighbor of B and C is a neighbor of B as well, it doesn't mean necessarily that A is going to be a neighbor of C. Um, so closing coefficients for these kinds of networks are very low. And on the other hand, distances are also very low because you have many, many shortcuts um, crossing these networks because they are random. So distances are short. So in regular graphs, clustering is high, distances are high, and in random math, it's the opposite. Well, and then in 98, there was the official birth, I think, of complex networks, with this publication of a very important paper by Duncan Watts and Stephen Strogatz, in which they propose a very nice model in which you start with a regular net network like this one, and for instance, a one-dimensional network with first and second neighbors. And with probability P, you take one of those edges, you disconnect it and reconnect it. You, you, you just rewire it randomly with any other site along the network in such a way that if this probability is equal to 1, you have a complete random graph. So with this parameter, P, you go from 0 to 1. You go from a completely regular network to a completely random network. And what they did was to plot um, two quantities as a function of p. Please note that this axis, p axis, is in log scale. What they show is that for p equals 0, this c here represents the clustering coefficient that I mentioned before, so the, some kind of well-defined notion of neighborhood. And in, in black, the black dots are the distances, so which is also very high in the, when p equals 0, if you want to go in the uh, leftmost plot from one, one side of the ring to the other side, you have to just uh, go along, uh, along the ring. There are no shortcuts for p equals 0. If you go, on the other hand, to p equals, equals 1 in this plot, what you're going to see is that closer coefficient is low and distances are small, just as you expect for a random graph. Now, interestingly, is that you have some intermediate region here for which clustering coefficient is large, I mean, comparable to that of a regular graph, and distances are small, comparable to those of a random graph. So this coexistence of high clustering coefficient, meaning some well-defined um, notion of a local neighborhood, some local order, so to speak, with uh, small distances, which means you have shortcuts to, to quickly go through a tr uh, travel across, across the network, uh, this coexistence uh, marked the birth of small world networks. That's what small world networks are. And then they just took very, very different networks, film actors in which two actors, uh, um, actors are nodes in the, those networks, and they are connected if they uh, were in a movie together. Uh, power grid or the connectome of C. elegans, and they notice that these, these real-life networks have um, distances which are comparable to those of the random versions of those networks, therefore short distances, and clustering coefficients which were much higher than their random counterparts. So again, large clustering coefficient and small distances. And so all those real-world world networks are small world networks, and this led to an explosion of papers about network in the sense that then, since then everything is a network, quote unquote. So you can see here air traffic network or this very other famous paper by Barabasis group in which each node, this is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae protein-protein interaction network in which each node 
represents a protein, and the links represent uh, links between a link between two proteins occurs whenever they interact uh, physically in this uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae network. The brain, of course, is a network, and so on and so forth. And th then this field essentially exploded to become a field, scientific field of its own, uh, with many, many publications nowadays. Okay, so now we more or less know what is a graph. So what is a speech graph? Well, a speech graph is very simple. It's just a, a speech graphs are directed multigraphs that represent sequential word relationships in a speech. This conception of, of speech graph uh, appeared in a second uh, publication of ours about, about this topic. In, in this, the, the context is the following. Consider this guy to be a subject in a psychiatric interview, and he's telling um, uh, the psychiatrist a dream about a dream. So he's saying, I was dreaming of a show. So we just take these words, I was dreaming of a show, and their temporal sequence represent the edges that you can see here in this uh, in the right mode. Uh, part of the plot. I, I say we call them multigraphs instead of graphs just because it may happen that two different words may be connected by more than one edge if the patient repeats the sequence. And if, if there is more than one edge between the, the two nodes, then we call this a multigraph. That's just a technical detail. Most importantly, what we're going to do now is very radical in the sense that once the speech is converted into a multigraph like this one, only the structure of the text is kept, and all the semantics is disregarded. So instead of working with the graph uh, that I'm showing you now, what we're going to be working with is this one, so without the semantic content. And what we do once we have this graph, we calculate what we call speech graph attributes, SGAs, which are essentially, essentially numbers that come out of these, uh, these structures. Consider this example. This, uh, this is a true example from, uh, from a speech of a patient. Once you have a graph like this, note that the semantics is already gone. You cannot see any word here. You calculate, for instance, the number of nodes, the number of edges, the, no the number of parallel edges, the number of repeated edges, the largest connected component of this graph. The largest connected component is just the maximum number of nodes in which all pair of, pairs of nodes are reachable from one another in the underlying undirected subgraph, that is, disregard, disregarding the direction of edges. You can also calculate the largest strongly connected component, which is essentially the same as LCC, except that you do respect the direction of edges. So note that this upper branch here in, that you see in LCC is gone from the LLC, because although you can reach the tip from the core in LCC, in LLC you cannot go back because you have to respect the direction of the, of the arrows. You can also calculate one node loops, two node loops, three node loops, and a bunch of other numbers. So in particular, these ASP, average shortest path, and CC closing coefficient are the same quantities that I mentioned before uh, that occurred in this watson um uh, paper. You can calculate just a bunch of numbers here. I'm listing here just 10 to 15 numbers. OK, so how do we use this as a tool for psychiatric diagnosis? The point is that speech graph attributes are objective quantitative measures from speeches of psych psychotic uh, subjects. So what we're going to do, what we did in this uh, paper in 2014, was the following. We had three groups of subjects, one from the schizophrenia group, one for the bipolar, and another for, for control, with 20 subjects in each group. So these are clinically significant numbers. And it's important to, to emphasize that the schizophrenia and bipolar groups were composed with, of chronic patients. So they had been well diagnosed um, by then. And we analyzed two kinds of speeches. One, in response to this request by the psychiatrist, please report a recent dream. So we're going to analyze dream reports. And another one, which is please report your waking activities immediately before the dream. So we refer to these as waking reports. Here are some examples of uh, true graphs that emerge from, from this scenario. 
here are some dream reports, uh, each, one speech from, from, each, from each group. This is the schizophrenia report, the first one, and then a bipolar dream report, and then a control dream report. You see that there's a clear, clear difference between schizophrenia and by the bipolar report in the sense that it gets, the bipolar report gets more structured, more connected somehow. The control seems to be somewhere in between them. Now, if you ask the patient to report on their daily activities, um, the, the waking report, it's not nearly as interesting. They don't look that much different anyway, anymore. And you see that in particular, the schizophrenia group, you, there's not much of a difference now uh, structurally between a dream report and a waking report. Um, so the numbers that I mentioned before, let me show them again here, the speech graph attributes, are going to reflect the difference that you just saw um, just by looking at the graphs. Um, and let's see how this um, emerges. Briefly reviewing the, the methodology about the data. So those patients they had just a standard method uh, for the, their diagnostic, 39 males and 21 females, all independently diagnosed by the standard DSM-4 ratings, SCID, structured interview. They were also subjected to psychometric scales so PANS, the positive and negative syndromes, syndrome scale, and BPRS, brief psychiatric rating scale, are psychometric scales in the sense that a psychiatrist has to uh, subjectively assess features of the speech, of the patient's behavior, and uh, attribute numbers to those variables, psychometric variables. And uh, interviews were con conducted in Portuguese with Brazilian subjects, and I'll come back to the issue of language uh, later on. As for the questions, how are we going to, what's the methodology regarding the questions? We asked we ask essentially two kinds of questions. Are speech graph attributes different for different groups? So we applied standard uh, tests to differentiate them. Kafka Wallis, Wilkinson ranks some tests with bone for any correction. And the second question is can one use graphs to classify subjects? In this case, we just trained a, a naive based classifier with eventually a subset of speech graph attributes using the structured interview results as a gold standard. Then we cross-validate and we assess performance with this quantity that will, be, will appear here as AUC, which means area under the rock curve, which essentially behaves as follow, follows. If it's close to 0.5, your binary classifier is essentially flipping a coin. If it's close to one, then it's very good. And so, results will range between 0.5 and 1. So what, what did we observe here? Uh, unfortunately, we had a, a, a small problem with the slide here. Let me jump to the copy of it, which is slightly, slightly smaller. I apologize for that. Please note that what we're seeing here are six box plots for LCC. This is, this is one of these. Um, speech graph attributes, the largest connected component. So dark gray is the schizophrenia group. You have here dream reports and here waking reports. The light gray is the bipolar group, dream reports and waking reports. And the white group is the control group. Again, the left part is dream reports, the right part is waking reports. What you see here uh, in this plot is that um, the schizophrenia group is different from the other groups only if you use dream reports. And if you look at the difference within the, the same group, for instance, the control group, they are different. This is the, the, the blue stars. So the dream reports of the control groups are different from the, the waking reports of the control groups. In, in the, this is the, the, the blue star. The same happens for the, the bipolar group, but not for the schizophrenia group. And this is the, the kind of result that you can obtain uh, just, just by looking at one um, speech graph attribute. Naturally, we have many of them. I'm showing you here 15 of them. And what you see eventually with some differences here and there is more or less the same scenario in the sense that the schizophrenia group is different from other groups only if you use dream reports. And the difference between dream and waking reports occur only for bipolar and control groups. If you go now back to the 
Next question, which is can we use, use graphs to classify subjects? Um, essentially, the result is that no matter which figure of merit you use to, cl to, classif to, to assess your classification, whether area under the rock curve, sensitivity, or specificity, you see that dream reports perform better than waking reports. All those results, the, the, the ones from the previous slide, let me go back a little bit, this one and this one for the classification are um, for raw data. We just took the, the whole speech from the patient and calculate those attributes. But then there's a question. Couldn't that be an artifact due to the fact that the schizophrenia patients speak much less than that? Um, if you just look at the word count, you will see the schizophrenia. Let me try to go back here. If you go to the word count, which is the upper left plot in this, uh, of these 15 plots, you see that the schizophrenia group speaks much less than the other groups. So it couldn't be just an, an artifact. Couldn't this um, classification properties be an artifact of that? So we wanted to control for that, control for verbosity. And the way we did this, did this is the following. We used the moving window with a fixed number of words. So if you assume that the, the raw data speech is, I walked into a place and I found my grandma. So we now just chop this speech into a fixed number of words, in this case, just five words to exemplify, and then move this window. And for each window, we have a different um, set of words and a different um, graph. And we calculate the speech graph attributes for each of these windows and then average over the windows. This way we can, by using the fixed number of words, have always um, speeches with the same number of words and therefore control for verbosity. If we now look at 30 word graphs, what do we see? We see, um, again, a difference between schizophrenia in the sense, the schizophrenia group and the other ones, in the sense that the schizophrenia group is less connected than the other groups in dream and waking reports. The bipolar group is less connected than the control group only in dream reports. And differences between dream and waking reports occur only for bipolar and the control groups. So now the verbosity explanation is excluded because um, all the speeches have the same quote unquote verbosity in the sense that they have, they have been um, chopped by fixed uh, windows. If you now use those 30 word graphs to do your classification, again, you see that dream reports here in, in yellow, in orange, I'm sorry, perform better than waking reports in almost all cases. Then there's a question whether speech graph attributes are somehow meaningful to a, to a psychiatrist. Because if you just run a computer program that calculates those things and gives you some results, it would be helpful if they had anything to do with something that psychiatrists already do in, in the clinic. So it actually is the case that uh, they can be interpreted, interpreted meaningfully. What I'm showing here, um, is the correlation between speech graph attributes and psychometric variables. So in the horizontal axis, we have a subjective axis of um, psychometric variables. In the vertical axis, we have an objective uh, assessment of the speech in the sense that they are speech graph attributes. And color coded, you have the correlations. The white circles means mean correlations which are statistically significant. And note that you have two panels, one for dream reports and another one for waking reports. And the result, therefore, is the following, that for dream reports, which is the upper panel here, uh, you have a clear anti-correlation um, of some speech graph attributes with negative and cognitive symptoms. So, so negative and cognitive symptoms are, are those columns here in the upper panel, such as flattened effects, poor contact, difficulty in abstract thinking, loss of spontaneity or fluency in speech in, in puns, emotional retraction, and flattened effect in BPRS. So I can only imagine how hard it must be for psychiatrists to be trained in order to, to assess this list of uh, features that I've just uh, read to you. 
And yet, if you calculate uh, the speech graph, which is very simple, a very simple computer code can do it, uh, it correlates, in this case, anti-correlates very strongly with those uh, exact features. So we can have objective measurements which, which correlate very strongly with subjective features. Now, for waking reports, which is a lower panel, you have anti-correlation only with general psychotic symptoms, which is why we saw before that dream reports are much better than waking reports for classification purposes. And finally, there's the question of language. The study was conducted in Brazil, so you could challenge these results asking whether they are specific to people who speak Portuguese, for instance. And so in a first attempt to check that, we have translated all speeches to different languages using Google Translate. And we run everything, all the analysis, uh, in English, in Spanish, and French, and German. And essentially, the results uh, remain. So up to now, what are some open questions and ongoing research that we are involved with now. Um, for instance, can it be used for early diagnostic or psychosis? Instead of a diagnostic, diagnostic, can it continuously quantify symptoms severity using graph attributes? Or more interestingly, why are dreams so informative? Because we don't recall them so well? because they are emotionally salient, because they are usually bizarre. That is, dreams are not approximately anchored on events shared with non-psychotic individuals. Because of what? I mean, there could be so many possibilities here. So we try to address some of these questions um, in, our, in another study of ours, which came out now in 2017. So let us start with this one. Can it be used for early diagnostic uh, of psychosis. Please keep in mind that everything that I've been showing you up to now is with chronic patients. So the diagnostic of those um, patients is very well established by now. And when we apply our technique, it's just a proof of concept kind of thing, right? Naturally, uh, it's much harder to predict the future. So in order to do that, the, the next, uh, next scenario was as follows. We took the interviews with patients in their first clinical contact uh, uh, in a psychiatric interview. So essentially, this is a moment of, of a very distressful moment for the patient, for the family. Very often, it's after their first psychotic episode, and they are being interviewed by the psychiatrist. In that situation, you have to wait up to six months of, of, of follow-up before a, properly, uh, a proper diagnostic can be performed, can be reached. So we, we asked ourselves, can speech graph attributes obtained here at this first clinical contact from patients which are therefore not yet chronically psychotic? Um, can those um, speech graphs predict diagnosis six months later? The data in this, in this case was composed of 21 patients. I'm sorry about this, uh, this typo here. And 21 controls of those patients, 11 um, converted to schizophrenia and 10 to bipolar disorder. And again, we asked the patients to, for dream reports, but we also asked them to report on negative images, positive images, neutral images. We asked about yesterday reports and all these memory reports. So these positive, negative, positive, and neutral images, re, image reports were intended to test the idea of uh, affective valence, affect, affective salience of the, of the dreams. And yesterday, in all this memory report, were intended to assess the issue of, of memory. And this is important because uh, if you, you cannot just rely on dreams. Simply for the fact that in our study, 36% of the schizophrenia group and 20% of the bipolar group fail to recall a single dream. So if you rely exclusively on dreams, uh, you miss many patients here. So this is an example of a negative image. You show this kind of image to the patient and ask them to report, to tell the story of this picture. Um, this is an example of a positive image. And here's an example of a neutral image. 
most importantly, we also decided by then, after three years after, first, after the previous study, to focus on most relevant attributes only. So instead of looking at, at, all, at all the 15 speech graph attributes, three were kind of enough. Just edges, largest connected component, and largest strongly connected component. So here, here's an example um, of a real speech describing the, 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 um, the negative image. I saw a plane crash, I think, a lot of people running, crying. It was really sad. I saw some blood, too. So if you convert this speech to a graph, this is, is the graph that you're going to obtain. And when you calculate the speech graph attributes, you find 21 edges, a largest connected component, which, is, which has 18 nodes, and a large strongly connected component, which has 15 nodes. One of the questions that we were interested in answering is the following. How random-like psychotic speech? Psychiatrists apparently refer to the speech of a patient when it's very, very disorganized as word salad, in the sense that it's just a mixture of words without uh, much of a structure. So can you quantify that, how random-like it is? The way we, we did this is the following. We took each of the speeches, like this one I'm showing you, and just so shuffle all the words. So if you take the speech, the original speech, and sh make one sh random shuffle, you, you obtain this kind of nonsense that you see here below. And please note that the number of words is preserved, as well as the number of links is also preserved. But the graph is completely different. So you go from this original graph to the, in the left to the shuffle graph in the right. And for each speech, we do this a thousand times. So a thousand different shufflings. And we calculate the speech graph attributes for all of these thousand shufflings, as well as for original graph. And now we're going to compare them. Aiming at answering this question, how random-like random -like is psychotic speech? So what I'm showing here um, is the following. The red dots represent each the largest strongly connected component of one speech from the schizophrenia group, one speech from the bipolar group, and one speech from the control group. So I'm representing three different speeches with the red uh, dots, the largest strongly connected component of those three speeches. And in blue, we have the histogram of the largest strongly connected component of 1,000 random versions of that speech. So the closest the red point is to the blue distribution, the more random-like it is by definition, because the blue distribution represents all the, ra the 1,000 random shuff shufflings of the original graph. So we use the z-score to quantify how much the red point, um, how close the red point is to the distribution. The z-score is just the look at the upper right, upper right corner of the uh, of the slide. It's x minus the average value of x divided by the standard deviation of x. So by definition, by construction, z has zero, zero mean, and standard deviation equals to 1. So what I'm showing here is one example. You see that the control group in the right plot, um, the LLC of the true speech is much, is kind of far away from the core of the distribution. And the schizophrenia group in the left plot, it's the opposite. It's right in the middle of the random distribution. So if now we go from one speech from each group to the whole group, to many speeches from each group, we, we have the following. Now in the lower plots, I'm showing the histogram of the z-score z of this LSC for, for all the, the, the subjects, for all the speeches. And what you see, if we, if we agree to call random-like zone anywhere when z is anywhere between minus 2 and 2 standard deviations, I mean minus 2 and 2, you see that the, the schizophrenia group, many subjects fall within this, within this random-like zone, and the bipolar group less so, and the control group even less so. You can count which percentage of each group falls within that random-like zone, and you'll find that the schizophrenia group is like 64% as opposed to 5% in the control group. So, yes, so this confirms um, some numbers. 
the random-like nature uh, of the speech, the speeches of some uh, species in the schizophrenia group. Going back to some of the questions, why are dreams so informative? Has it got to do with we don't recall them so well, or because they're emotionally salient, or what? So this is where those different imagery reports uh, come in handy. If we now compare the, uh, again, classification performance using the area under the rock curve of those reports uh, by different categories, we can see that dream reports is still the best thing you can use. The second, one, the second best is negative image reports, and the third best is positive image reports. So dream reports still yield the best predictions. Uh, neutral image and yesterday image and oldest memory, oldest memory, they are not so good. So you see that emotional salience seems to play a role because negative image and positive image reports uh, perform perform well. But apparently there's there's more to dreams because they they they, are, they perform better. And we want to go back to the question that uh that I started with in the beginning in that criticism of DSM-5. Instead of a diagnostic, can this technique of speech graph attributes, can it continuously quantify symptoms, severity, using graph attributes? That is, can I go away from equating classification with, a, with diagnosis? Can I do better than just classification? Because what, what if those categories are not justified? So we did this in our 2017 paper. What you're seeing here is the following. In the horizontal axis, you have a combination of subjective variables of the psychometric scales. So remember, threat and affection, et cetera, et cetera. You just have a combination of those uh, variables, and you can construct a subjective scale a subjective index. And in the vertical axis, uh, we have what we call uh, the disorganization index, which is a combination of objective speech graph attributes, which you can somehow combine in order to have this uh, very strong correlation with the subjective scale. Uh, please note that this correlation is very strong regardless of the color of the dots here, which is, which is showing to which group each patient belongs. So they correlate very well regardless of classification. Obviously, if you want, you can also use the, the, the organization index to make classifications if you want. If you look to the right plot, you will see that the schizophrenia group has a larger disorganization index than the control group or the bipolar group, but you don't have to. So this somehow allows you to, the, the, the organization index somehow, somehow allows you to continuously classify symptom severity, even if you don't have or you don't want to have a classification. So finally, let us go to our conclusions and some future perspectives, things that we are working on and some other results. The conclusion is that speech graph analysis um, seems to be a potentially fast, non-invasive, low cost, and language variant tool for psychiatric diagnosis, potentially able to drive uh, a more objective search for biomarkers. It's, it's important to, rem to remember that not all speeches are equal. For some reason, dream reports are more informative for diagnosing psychosis. And finally, we don't see this as a replacement for psychiatrists, but rather as an auxiliary tool for them. We see them as something analogous to psychiatrists um, for psychiatrists to what a blood test would be to a general clinician. It's a, it's a useful tool, but it does, does not replace the doctor, of course. Naturally, this, this um, analogy will be valid only if the method is validated with a larger sample. So what else can speech graph be applied to? We have applied to dementia, so has, this has nothing to do with psychosis, and still in the dementia, for, for dementia questions, issues like distinguishing between Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment, 
the speech graph tec speech graphs techniques um, have proven useful, and also for child development, uh, in which those speech graph attributes have been shown to correlate well with, with some theory of mind and reading performances. And what's next? Well, the big question here is to validate this method with a larger sample, naturally. So we have an ongoing collaboration with uh, Diego Slezak in Argentina and Vizor Beisha. They are respected, respectively experts in semantic and acoustic analysis. And we all now have a grant from, from Bergen Ingelheim, which has included dream reports in the protocol of a clinical trial for a new potential drug for schizophrenia. This will raise the number of subjects in our studies from 10, 20 subjects to the hundreds now. And this will make the, the, me the method much more useful if it is validated. And as a final note, the, the software which calculates those speech graph attributes is freely available in, uh, in this website. Anyone can use it. Naturally, it does not give you any diagnostic, but it gives you the numbers uh, if you're interested for research purposes, for instance. So that's it for, for today. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much.